Uh, my name is Tracy Contizano, um, T-R-A-C-Y-C-O-N-T-I-Z-A-N-O. I'm a nurse um, at UCSD in San Diego in the emergency room. And I'm working at Bellevue Hospital in Manhattan, one of the oldest hospitals in the nation, in the United States of America, um, in New York, um, in the CCU, which is the intensive care unit. Can you tilt the the phone so we have a little less headroom right there yes that's better perfect so can you you know first of all um you're from san diego ucsd how did you end up going to new york um a couple of my friends um emailed me how i could help out in new york um i went to my boss and told them hey do you think that i could do this and my boss was very supportive and said yeah go for it and so i actually ended up here not knowing what I was going to step into. Um, and I honestly was very confident of my skills and thought that this would be something that I would be able to do on without any hesitation. And, and what is your role there at the hospital? What, what, are, what, is your, what are you doing? Um, I am actually a frontliner nurse. I actually walk in and I assume care of two to three patients a night that are all ventilated patients are on ventilators. Um, these patients are on at least six to nine drips. I mean, when I walked in, this is like something I have never seen in all of my 23 year nursing career. I have never ever seen this many people from wall to wall on ventilators on nine drips, nine drips. And these are IV drips that sustain their lives. I mean, they keep them alive. And I have never seen the volumes of these many patients on this many drips, keeping them alive, or the ventilators keeping them alive. I mean, these are the sickest of sick patients I have ever seen. This is so overwhelming. Um, I am maintaining and I'm keeping, you know, my head above water, but it's very crazy of how sick these patients are. And just when you think you have a handle on something, something else comes up that we didn't expect. It's just crazy. It's it, it, it really sounds, you know, and. For you to volunteer and, and go there, did you have any idea that you'd be walking in basically the epicenter of the illness for the United States, really? No, and when they say it's a hot zone, it is definitely a hot zone. Um, when we walk on the unit, it's definitely everybody's COVID positive. Um, when you don your gear, your PPE gear, you're in total gear the whole entire 13 hours. I mean, it's 12 to 13 hours, depending on if you get relief, you know, when you get relief. Um, and so I've never, I never thought that I would be an expert of putting my gear on. I mean, these are patients that when we first started nursing, I mean, you would get a TB patient and you would put your gear on and you would think about how you put your gear on. This is like putting on your pajamas at night. I mean, now we're getting so used to putting it on because we put it on so much that we just put it on quickly. But I mean, there's a code that we actually hear overhead when people are coding or people are going down and you usually only hear that code in the hospital maybe once in a week we're hearing it at least about 12 times a night i mean that means the, the doctors have to go react to those patients i mean this is sad that we're actually getting used to hearing this because these patients are very sick and when you started there when you arrived was it already had it escalated that high or or yes. have you watched it escalate no, I, these nurses, these New York nurses are commendable. I mean, the fact that they are keeping in high spirits, they've been dealing with this since October and they are, they're very cheerful. They're in high spirits. They're very welcoming to us traveling nurses. They take us in under their wings. I don't know how many times they have to answer the same exact questions over and over again, because we're new to the facility and every day new travelers are coming in and every day they have to answer the same exact questions and they still do it with a smile on their face. They still find bright lights. They take me. They took me over and watched, made me watch the sunrise in the morning when I felt so exhausted I couldn't even keep my eyes open because of all the work we did to keep a patient alive one night. And they still took me over to the window to make me watch the sunrise because they have to find some joy every day to make our make us keep going. And there's a beautiful window where I watched the sunrise, and I try to go over there every morning to watch the sunrise, and it, it's over. I believe New Jersey and it's beautiful because we're on Manhattan 
So we're able to watch out that window, the beautiful sunrise. And every day I make myself go over there, no matter how hard my night is, to watch that beautiful sunrise, just to say, hey, there is life out there. And hey, we are making a difference because it feels like we're not. I mean, we're trying. We're trying our best to bring these loved ones home to their families. And that's the most important thing. But we don't have, we don't get breaks. We do not have breaks. So we work the whole entire shift without any bathroom breaks, without any food breaks barely any water breaks if we get any at all because we it is a very hard shift so these people are very sick and it's very important for people to stay home they need to realize this is not the common cold this is not something you can just stay home and get over you have to make sure that you stop the transmission so that the you don't end up on the ventilator like these patients these patients were walkie-talkie patients these patients are people that walked about just like me and you and then they ended up in on a ventilator in the ICU can you, can you tell me, I mean, we're, we are seeing from our end on the West Coast, these reports about, you know, doctors having to make life and death decisions, who's going to get a ventilator, who's not going to get a ventilator. <clears throat> Is that really what you're seeing there in this emergency hospital? I'm seeing that um, there does come a point where um, they can no longer sustain life. Um, we have thrown every medication that we can at a patient. We still keep them alive as long as their body sustains. However, this sickness, it is unpredictable. COVID is really unpredictable. Um, I, I have never seen patients that, um, on this amount of drips. I mean, these certain pressors, they're, they're called pressors. They keep patients alive and they are on pressors on amounts that I have not seen in a long time. And we still are throwing different drugs at them and it, they're still not sustaining life. And so at one point you just have to say, there's nothing else we can do for this patient, unfortunately, and their bodies just won't sustain life. So at that point, there's nothing more we can do. I mean, we keep them as comfortable as we can. We are sitting there and as much as I can, I speak to them because I believe hearing is very, important and I try to give them the comfort that I can in between all my patients and I still have to make sure that the people that I have to take care of I take care of it is a very challenging ICU is no joke it's very challenging and I like as I said and I can't reiterate it enough these these patients are very challenging I've never seen patients sicker and, and just for our audience here in San Diego, and, and you coming from San Diego and, and going out to help us, you know, what can you compare this to, what you're seeing? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I have been through, you know, the flu. I have been through many, many illnesses. I have seen so many sicknesses over my 23 years. I have seen really... I mean, I deal with patients that are septic. I deal with cancer patients. I, I have dealt with the sickest of sick patients in all of my 23 year career. And I have never, ever seen anything like this. And I'll say I was a naysayer. I was someone who took this lightly as a nurse in San Diego because I was like, oh, you know, I haven't seen really sick patients from this until I came here. And let me tell you, the minute I walked through that door, I, was, I felt overwhelmed. And as a nurse and someone that is very confident, I felt very overwhelmed and it's taking a lot. I mean, every night I go home and I cry. That's the only thing I can do. The only solace I get is off Facebook. Everyone from San Diego is sending me very encouraging messages. They're keeping me going every night. Every day when I get home from work, I post a video of how hard my night went. I cry it out on Facebook. I cry it out at home and everybody sends me encouraging messages to tell me to keep going that I'm a hero, which I am not, not by any means, but it just makes me feel really good and says, Tracy, you can do another day because it's very challenging. And you just feel like you're not winning. You're, you're trying to win a losing battle because COVID is definitely winning out here. And it's just sad. So the only way we can win is to do what we're supposed to do and stay home. And you know what? Every day I risk my life. Every day I walk into that unit, I can feel the heat from COVID. I can feel that I'm walking into a room that it's airborne now. These ventilators make it airborne. And every day I walk into that room, it has now become airborne. And I have to take the precautions because of the airborne. And most of the nurses, the staff nurses are out sick with COVID. 
So I'm the one that has to step up and be that person that has to take that chance to get COVID. And I'm taking every precaution necessary that I can to prevent myself from getting it because somebody has to be at bedside. And as they come back, we cheer them and say, thank you for coming back to your job because you took the risk, you got it. And here you are back at bedside as a New York nurse and you have a smile on your face and you're not scared to be coming back to this battlefield. Because as I always say on my Facebook, we're slaying a beast, COVID, and we're gonna win. I don't know how we're gonna win, but we're gonna win. We've heard you know, stories about uh, you know, you not having the proper PPE. Are, are you now, you know, was that the case? And are you now getting the proper PPE to help protect you? We are getting the proper PPE, but every night we run out. They honestly, they keep trying to, re we were replenished, 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 and we are repl getting replenished. Um, but we are using the same mask. We're just putting masks over those masks. Um, we use the same N95, we just put a mask over it. Um, we have to do what we have to do to get by. We're running out of supplies. I mean, you can only, you can't ask the hospital to keep, I mean, they can only put, give so many supplies a night. And there's so many patients. We have over 200 people on ventilators right now. Just imagine 200 people's on ventilators. That's a lot of people in one hospital on ventilators. They're putting ventilators in any place that they can put a put ventilator. Like, I mean, we're trying to sustain life here and any means necessary. So, I mean, med surge have ventilators. Like it's wherever we can put a person. We're trying to sustain life and they're doing a great job out here with what they have to work with they're doing an excellent job out here i mean i commend all of the new york nurses out here and the travelers for stepping in because you know what this is an unknown environment for us and this is unknown circumstances for us and yes we are walking into a very hot zone i mean any unit you walk into you know when you walk through those doors this could be the day that i'm going to get COVID. this could be the day but you know what, you do it because you want your fellow nurses to feel supported and you want those patients to walk home. One day they may walk home to their family. You have to keep hope out here. That's the only thing you can do. Tracy, are you able to describe, you know, what kind of a toll this is taking on the medical help, uh, taking on yourself? And you mentioned the injury to, you know, your nose from putting the mask so tight. Can you describe any of that? Um, I think, as the days go on, where in some units you're able to remove your mask for a little bit of time, but in the ICU you do not. Um, you're the patients are so critical that you're actually running into the rooms every two minutes. You have to go in and adjust the the um, the tubes that actually help them breathe. You're going in to adjust whatever you need to adjust for those patients, and you if there's a code you're running in to help save the life. So you cannot take your masks off. So wearing those masks for 12 hours, as well as goggles and a face shield, because you've got to protect yourself from the sputum coming out of the ventilators, because now it is airborne. You wear those for 12 to 13 hours, and I'm developing um, scabs on my inside of my eyes because of the pressure of the goggles being on there. And then also just the pressure of the face mask being on there for such a long amount of time is causing blisters on my nose as well as the back of my ears. So, but those are scars that will heal. Patients' lives are what matter. This is just superficial scars. I'm not worried about any of that stuff. The pain I, just, I can walk away from and I like feeling that pain. I like feeling that pain because that shows me and reminds me I'm alive. That's the most important thing to me is to remind me every day that God has given that opportunity that I'm alive. And those people can't feel that right now. And so I don't care about that kind of stuff. Uh, Tracy, you approached us because you were concerned about some of the videos out there and you wanted to, to, to share your thoughts on, you know, what it's really like in, in the ICU there in New York. Mm -hmm. Any, anything you want to sum up there on in regards to that? Uh, my most important thing that I want to take away from this is with all the statistics out there is for you guys to remember these patients are not numbers. The deaths are not numbers. Everything is a number out there. These are people's family members. This is someone's mother or someone's father or someone's daughter or wife, their children. Um, 
unfortunately we don't have time that we get to spend with them and talk to them or dance for them or do any of that kind of lovely stuff for them unfortunately um i'm hoping someday that they get to go home to their families and they get to do that kind of stuff for them the most important thing to me is that you remember that um your frontliners and these are new york frontliners that are really doing making a difference are all your frontliners out there that are making a difference those people are risking their lives out there and they are doing the best that they can and it might not be the compassion that you're used to seeing or the compassion of what you think nurses should be doing but we are doing the best that we can with what limited resources we have limited um care that we can provide but we are trying to do the best that we can with what we have to work with and it's pretty chaotic out here and but it's important to remember that um, these people aren't numbers because all the numbers that flash on the street of, on the screen of deaths and all that kind of stuff it's it's, it's a person and, and you're seeing it firsthand i really admire how long do you plan to stay out there and help um, till May 3rd and if my if UCSD allows me I would like to extend another month because I feel that they really need my help I mean uh, every day I come in they always thank me they're blessed um, they're like oh they sit there waiting and they're like please let let another nurse sh show up wow and, and what kind of shifts are you working you're working like 12 hour shifts every day I'm working seven nights a week every week for 12 hours it's sometimes 13 because we don't know if the nurse is going to show up to relieve me. Oh my God. It's incredible. Any other, you know, news or thoughts that you want to share with our, your fellow, you know, your UCSD nurses back here or San Diegans? I just want everybody to remember, um, to stay home. That's the most important thing. Keep your social distancing, make sure you mask up, everybody mask up. That's the most important thing too and um keep fighting it's very important and i just want everybody to keep the frontliners to remember to keep up your strength we're very good caregivers but we're not very good caregivers of taking care of ourselves it's very important to keep hydrated make sure that we um, make sure we eat make sure we get enough sleep because if we get sick we can't take care of the sick so it's very important to take care of ourselves and keep a positive outlook um it's very good to um meditate and it's okay to cry every day i cry and i feel better after i cry because you know what i think all of us are going to suffer from a little bit of ptsd after all of this after everything we've seen so i think it's very important to talk to people if you have to vent on facebook or any other social media or even your family by chatting on the phone it's important to do that because we need to have some way to get rid of all this um sadness that we're feeling th through all this um pandemic and it might, you know, might not even hit you until once this all starts to calm down. But 200 people on ventilators, ventilators every day, it's just remarkable what you're doing, and we're so proud of pr proud of that, and uh, happy to share your story. Um, thank you so much. There's so much here to get out. Uh, let me get that to our crews. But really appreciate you taking the time, and I hope that you'll keep in touch and keep us posted on how things are going. Thank you so much for taking the time to even listen. Thank you, Tracy. I'll be back in touch and I'll, okay. I'll send you a link to the story. All right. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Be safe. Okay. Prayers bye. To you. Okay.